One year after the death of Masa Amini, what has changed in Iran? Protests over her death in police custody spiraled into the worst political turmoil since the Iranian Revolution. But that hasn't stopped the government from cracking down on dress codes and dissent. I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Iran. Protesters in Iran chanted women, life, freedom, following the death of Masa Amini in police custody one year ago. Demonstrations were fueled by authorities' claims that she died from an existing medical condition when her family said she had been beaten. In the unrest that followed, rights groups say 500 people were killed, hundreds wounded, and thousands arrested. Seven people with links to the protests were executed. In the aftermath, morality police disappeared from the streets, but have since returned, along with surveillance cameras. So what's changed in the country since? And has the government's crackdown widened a rift between ordinary Iranians and the ruling elite? One year ago, an unknown Iranian woman was arrested stepping out of a train station in Tehran, allegedly for wearing her hijab incorrectly. 22-year-old Mahsa Amini died in police custody three days later. Her death sparked demonstrations across the country that would turn into a revolt against the regime itself. Protesters burned their hijabs on the street, torched police vehicles and chanted death to the dictator, defying the country's supreme leader. Thousands of people around the world joined demonstrations to show their support with women posting videos of themselves on social media, cutting their hair off in a show of solidarity. For 43 years, the people of Iran have been oppressed, and now they're coming together as never before for the rights of women. This is a moment in history, and we are all rallying behind them, not just Iranians, but people of the world are rallying behind this topic because we want freedom for the people of Iran. The government restricted messaging apps while security forces launched a violent crackdown using tear gas, clubs and even live ammunition. The paramilitary Basij group took a leading role in quashing dissent. According to human rights groups, more than 500 people were killed and thousands arrested. Seven people with links to the protests were executed, with dozens more reportedly charged with capital offences or sentenced to death. Days before the anniversary, Iranian President Ebrahim Raisi defended the government's response. Those who intend to abuse Madame Amini's name under this pretext to be an agent of foreigners to create this instability in the country, we know what would happen to them. And they know that endangering the security of the people and security of society will create a big cost. After Amini's death, more women began disobeying Iran's hijab laws and the controversial morality police disappeared. But they have now returned, along with security cameras to identify unveiled women. And the government is pushing harsher regulations. If a new bill passes, a woman could face up to 10 years in prison for defying dress code laws, a sentence comparable to murder and drug trafficking. Businesses serving them could be shut down. The draft law could be described as a form of gender apartheid as authorities appear to be governing through systematic discrimination with the intention of suppressing women and girls into total submission. The unrest has also hit the economy, already under heavy Western sanctions. The real has plunged to an all-time low, with inflation skyrocketing, leaving many Iranians struggling to make ends meet. It's getting worse every day. People are having hard lives. Our authorities should first provide good economic conditions. Hijab is a completely secondary and personal issue. The government is taking measures to prevent more protests of the anniversary. Security forces have put up checkpoints and restricted the internet. Rights groups say several activists have been detained. And Masa Amini's father has been interrogated by police, while her uncle was arrested last week. 
but even if the Islamic Republic can keep demonstrators off the streets, have authorities made the underlying issues go away? Joining me now to talk about conditions in Iran one year after those protests are from Washington. Negar Mortazavi, she is a senior fellow at the Center for International Policy, a journalist and also the host of the Iran podcast. Alex Vatanka is the director of the Iran program and senior fellow at the Middle East Institute. Mohammed Mirandi, he is a professor at Tehran University. Thanks all so much for being with me. Mohammed Mirandi, I'll first uh, let you tell us how it feels where you are right now. We're hearing that these extra measures have been taken to prevent any further protests on this anniversary. Is there a sense of tension or apprehension in Iran right now? No, I uh, drove from my house, my apartment, to this studio, which is pretty far away from where I live. And uh, there's not a single police officer or police car uh, present anywhere. It's interesting because, as you know, the reports from outside have said that there is, you know, a sense of security imposed upon the people in the country right now to make sure that no one marks this day. Is That's not the sense you're getting? The only thing that uh, the police and the government has warned of is uh, riots. Because last year, as you recall, uh, there were a, lar a large number of riots that were very violent. After Masa Amini passed away, uh, Persian media language outlets, largely based in London, but across Western countries, were claiming that she was tortured and beaten to death. I, I, interestingly, more recently, a couple of physicians who worked or cooperated what, with one of these media outlets admitted that there was nothing in the brain scan that they saw. Uh, back, but they were quiet back then because they wanted to create tension in society. But immediately, so initially, many people thought that she was beaten to death. And uh, so there were protests in different cities. But then after two or three days, when the footage came out showing that she had, she, there was no sign of any physical trauma or injury, those died down. But then the riots began. The mm -hmm. riots were very violent. Uh, they were egged on by Persian media uh, in the West. I've tweeted a few of the clips where in, on television, they would call for people to kill police officers. And s almost 70 police officers, or roughly 70 police officers, were killed. So there's a sharp distinction to be made between protests and riots. Okay. Uh, let me turn to Negar, uh, because we know that there are two very distinct narratives on, on what happened and what the aftermath actually was. Uh, but as it stands today, from what I've been told inside, from inside Iran, a, a lot of women are now going out without headscarves, but they don't necessarily feel safe. What do you see as the case on the ground right now? And the, and the tensions that I asked Professor Mirandi about, do you think they're there? Well, I think what we saw, Andrea, wasn't anything short of a cultural revolution. We saw a feminist uprising, the spark of it, uh, was the death or killing in custody of this young Kurdish woman because of how she was dressed. Let's not forget, Masa Amini was arrested because of what she was wearing, which to many even religious and traditional Iranians looked pretty okay. And um, people were puzzled by why exactly would this woman have to be arrested, detained, and eventually die because of how she was dressed. So I think women, girls, and allies showed up for her, for this unknown young Kurdish woman from a small town, to say enough is enough. This imposition of a mandatory dress code that's been going on for four decades on Iranian women, and they've slowly pushed back on the limits of it. I think this was a watershed moment, and they pushed the state back, essentially saying, you can't kill someone for how they're dressed. And so what we saw in the past year is a transformation, many women, many girls, and this is not just in Tehran, not just in big cities. I hear from many smaller cities, even traditional religious areas, that they have bravely defied this uh, dress code and are coming into public without the, with the Islamic hijab, as you were saying. Not everyone feels safe, 
But what I hear when I talk to women is when they see each other, when they see other women and other girls more and more doing it, they feel safer. And let me also add that there's a portion of the religious and traditional part of the society that sympathizes with that. I've spoken to women who wear the hijab themselves out of choice, but they don't support this form of harassment of public violence against women in the name of morality police. And they support their sisters and daughters and granddaughters right to choose to not wear the hijab. I think that's what the mm. government has been missing for four decades. And that's what, with the death in custody of this woman, the population tried to show them with a big push. And we're not going back to before September 2022. Okay, you say that, quote, we're not going back to before September 22nd, 2022. But uh, let me ask Alex Vatonk, I mean, what do you make of where the law actually stands right now, especially in regards to the morality police. As we said, they disappeared in the immediate aftermath, but are they back and are they reestablishing themselves as a force like before, or some say potentially even worse because they were left rather embarrassed by those protests? Right, I mean, look, let me start off by saying something that is pretty widely recognized. A 19 year old healthy Iranian woman is security forces and ends up, um, ends up dead, murdered. And, you know, we can't rewrite history. This is what happened to Mahsa Amini. Uh, in terms of where we are a year later, look, uh, the only reason the Islamic Republic forces the mandatory hijab, which even clerics, many clerics in Iran, have come out since 1979. Mm -hmm. If you go back all the way to, to when the revolution happened in 1979, Ayatollah uh, Mahmoud Talagani's of this world, they said from day one, if you have to force people to paradise, if you have to force people to become religious, then that's the end of the regime. So basically what we have here is forced hijab is just about political control of this society that's restless. That's all it is. There's nothing religious about it. It's about political control. Okay, Professor Mirandi, I'd like you to comment on that, especially what Nagar was saying as to whether or not women who are not wearing the hijab now should they feel safe or are they in danger? Because the government, as we know, is now exploring much stricter punishment, including even prison terms for, for dress code violations. So how should women feel if they choose not to wear the hijab? I think it's obvious that's a, a very loaded question and it's a meaningless question. People in Iran, women in Iran feel much safer in Tehran than in the city where you reside. Women in Iran now, last year, two years ago, could walk on the streets of Tehran, in most of Tehran, at midnight and feel safe and secure. In Tehran, after midnight, people are in the parks with their families. Do you see that in most places across Europe? So let's not give a very misleading picture of the reality in Iran, a country where my own boss at the University of Tehran, the dean of my faculty for the last 20 years, 16 of those years was led by women. So I, I think that you have to keep that in mind. The point is that whatever the law in Iran is, even before Mahsa Amini passed away, the law was never uh, enforced. We had women across Tehran who didn't wear the hijab before Mahsa Amini passed away. And as I said, the protests were because people felt that she was beaten, and many people initially believed what the Persian media in the West were saying, that she was beaten to death. After that, the protests, when it became clear that there was no evidence, they, these, they, the protests died down and turned into riots. And that's when things began to get violent. And that's when the police intervened. And during those interventions, roughly 70 police officers were killed. And terror organizations based outside the country, like the MEK, like the Komole in northern Iraq, were claiming that we are in charge of the riots or we are influencing the riots. And Persian media based in Western capitals were calling on violence. That is the issue. Otherwise, women in Tehran feel very safe. 
And as I said before, coming from my home to this building, which is pretty far away, there was not a, there was not a single police officer anywhere. Okay, Alex, go ahead. I could see you shaking your head at several points no, there. No. There is so much I can say to Dr. Mirandi's comments. I think we, we, we don't see the same Iran. And, and I know what he will say. He will say, I live in Washington. I don't know the Iran that he lives in. But don't listen to me, uh, Dr. Mirandi. You don't have to listen to someone like me who lives 7,000 miles away from Washington. I mean, from Tehran. Listen to your own people in Iran. Everything isn't a conspiracy. You know that. We both know it's not a conspiracy. You know, you refer to the rioters. It's not just about what the last year. It's a long list of things that have been going on. So, look, I could sit here for hours and hours. What you know and I know, the biggest problem the regime faces right now, or the Islamic Republic, Not let me not use the word regime because I know that's not liked. The Islamic Republic's biggest problem right now is denial. It's a denial about the anger in Iranian society. And it's not just about cultural issues. It's a whole host of issues. And that denial will bring the, the Islamic Republic down. Again, don't take my word for it. Listen to people who are saying this in Iranian media right now as we speak. They're warning you that you've lost touch with the young Iranian people, that the Islamic Republic that came to be 1979 really doesn't know how to speak the language of the youth. And that's the problem. I heard that the Minister of Intelligence uh, Ismail Khatib said 50, not one, not five, but 50 foreign intelligence services were involved in the last year's riots with zero evidence. I hear you. MEK was involved one way or another. And, and, and uh, absolutely, some opposition groups had an interest in this. But fundamentally, that anger is rooted in the policies of the Islamic Republic. Again, not my words, words of people who live in Iran as you do. Okay, let me get to Negar. Because, Negar, we'll conclude with this. I mean, as you know, there have now been several moments where people have said, finally, okay, Iran is changing. These, these protesters can't be ignored, only to see a return to the status quo. So what has it all been worth in the end, especially for women's rights? Is there no difference at all, or is there slow, incremental progress that will terminate in a real change, fundamental change for women in Iran? I think what we saw last year was a giant leap. Women have been pushing the limits of the mandatory hijab for about four decades slowly, and not even in a political way, in their everyday life. But what we saw over the past year is a kind of transformation that would you would normally see in about two decades. It came in one year. The number of women who said enough is enough and they took it off. And as I said, when they see each other, it just gives them more courage, more bravery to do even more. Now we see it in government offices. Now we see it in universities. Now we see it in not just public places, inside cafes by employees. So the state would like to push them back to where they were. I don't think they can for four decades. They haven't been. The state has essentially accepted this push by women slowly. As your guest in Tehran even said, the hijab wasn't fully enforced even before Masa Amini because specifically women have been pushing back against it for four decades. And I think this giant leap we saw in the past year is going to remain. Yes, the state may push back a little bit, but I think women have occupied now new spaces without the hijab. Schoolgirls, not just women, young girls. And I don't think there's going back to that. It's just a matter of how or ever the state will hear this call will hear and understand this crisis of legitimacy that they have, that a big part of the population, the youth, are saying, we don't like the way things are being done. We don't like this political, economic, social, cultural policies. And, and if change is going to be imposed on the state or not. So I don't think it's all futile. I don't think all is lost. I don't think all these lives were lost for nothing. And I think the gains that women have had as far as the bodily autonomy uh, and how they dress in the past year is something that the state can't push okay. back. Negar, that will have to be the final word. I'd like to thank really all three of my panelists so much for being with us on this segment of the Newsmakers. Greatly appreciate it. Now, in the wake of last year's protests, a movement started for women around the world to show their solidarity with the women in Iran. Many chose to make a public statement by cutting their hair. And one of the most publicized cuts was that of Belgian-Iranian parliamentarian Darya Safai. She cut her hair during a parliamentary session and was joined by the foreign minister, 
Hadja Lahbib both received applause from Belgian lawmakers. And Daria Safai joins me now from Brussels to share her thoughts on the one-year anniversary of Masa Amini's death. Daria, thanks so much for being with us. First, bring us back to what you saw and how you felt a year ago when Masa Amini died and these protests first erupted. Were you surprised, especially with the momentum that they gained? Actually, when I think about those days, they were one of the most, the darkest days of Iranian people. Having a girl of 22 years old, that's so innocent and beautiful at the beginning of the life, being killed by uh, the police uh, regime of the regime, it was a shock for every Iranian, every mother and father. That's how it was a trigger to begin a revolution, which is not yet done. They are in the middle of their revolution, and the demanding of this revolution is much more than only women's rights. The Iranian are decided once for always taking back their country and making mm. a secular democracy of that country. And when I remember at that moment, young and old, women and men were at the streets of every city in Tehran, such a large, big protest against what they have already asked from the regime, freedom, mm. giving, taking back their country. I am still so proud to see they are continuing so bravely this fight against this regime. Right. You just explained really why you felt this sense of solidarity with them and then why you cut your hair. So I'm going to ask, what are your concerns then today, given Iran's position now on the world stage? You have to admit, in a sense, it has been boosted. Uh, by certain relationships. Um, it now looks that it will get some money from the United States. Funds are being released. It has new relationships with Saudi Arabia, stronger ties with Russia, even going into Africa. Now, you had also an issue in Belgium because your own lawmakers managed to bring an Iranian delegation for a mayor's conference to their capital city. You even said at one point you didn't quite feel safe in Belgium anymore because... Iranians were allowed to come in, uh, visas granted immediately, and you felt you were being watched. Explain then what you think going forward now for where Iran will be and what kind of revolution, if you believe it's that, will allow they will allow to unfold. Actually, as you say, nowhere is safe until this regime is uh, uh, the regime of Iran. Uh, although Iran has a lot of um, potential, Iranian people can make it happen. But unfortunately, as you told, the Western countries are still um, helping this regime to stand uh, their place. And this is unfortunate, not only for Iranian women. As a member of a parliament in Belgium, I tried several times to make it clear what are the advantages of a democratic, secular Iran for the whole world, and especially Western countries. This is what we are going to search, and, uh, and that potential is helping, uh, we can make it happen through helping the Iranian people. But what the Western country are still doing is just a sort of negotiation with the smugglers because they don't believe that the Iranian can make it happen. But they forget if they are still going to help Iranian regime and Ayatollahs. How can the Iranian people overwin this uh, mm. uh, fight. They should invest in those people, not financially, not through military, but still uh, moral support helps the Iranian people to keep uh, their fight. Still, they don't help, but Iranian people are not hopeless. They are still on the streets. The women are fighting this, uh, are, are fighting still uh, without a mandatory hijab. They are going on the streets at the risking of their life. Um, as you have heard, there are cameras in the big cities like Tehran mm. to film the women and they uh, oppose the lashes, they, they give them the lashes, they give them the um, uh, very high uh, payments. Uh, that right, they and that's, that's what, what causes people to say that what progress they feel they've made over the last year and the fact that you do see many women on the streets now openly not wearing the hijab, more than before at least, 
um, that that's all going to be turned around again because of laws that are now being proposed to increase penalties for violating dress codes? I don't believe that it will make it um, much, much more difficult. This fight is already uh, such a long time busy and it will find a way. It's like a river. Once it's begun, it never ends until it gains the goal. I think the Iranian and the young generation especially, they are much braver than what we, had se we have seen before. They know what they, are want. they want. They want freedom. It's already too late for this regime. But that's why in the Western country, I am asking for stopping helping this Ayatollah's regime mm. because I believe in the power of this river, the river of young generation of Iranian women and men all together can make an end to this regime. Okay. We should just believe in it and support it. Zarya Safai, we will have to leave it there. I'd like to thank you so much for joining us on this edition of the Newsmakers. Greatly appreciate it. And uh, thank our viewers as well. Remember, you can follow us on X. And do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We will see you next time.